Eugene Kontorovich is a professor at George Mason's Antonin Scalia School of Law and the director of its Center for International Law in the Middle East. Before coming to George Mason, he had been a professor at Northwestern University School of Law for 11 years. An expert in international and constitutional law, he's published over 30 academic articles in the leading law reviews and peer-reviewed journals. His scholarship has been cited in leading international law cases in the US and abroad. Professor Kontorovich is also the head of the International Law Department at the Kohelet, Kohelet. Kohelet Policy Forum, a Jerusalem-based think tank, and is recognized as one of the world's preeminent experts on international law and the Arab-Israeli conflict. He has emerged, so excuse me, he has emerged as a one-man legal lawfare brain trust for the Jewish state, according to Haaretz. Professor Kontorovich also plays a leading role in many Israel-related policy matters and is regarded as the intellectual architect of U.S. state laws regarding boycotts of Israel. In his work at Forum Kohelet, he regularly advises his senior Israeli, U.S., and European officials. His expertise is often sought out and quoted by all the major news organizations, including the New York Times, to the Wall Street Journal, CNN, Fox News, BBC, and NPR. He has been honored with a fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and with the Federalist Society's prestigious Beta Award, given annually to a scholar under 40 for outstanding scholarship and teaching. Professor Kontorovich attended the University of Chicago for college and law school and taught there for two years as a visiting professor. After law school, he clerked for Judge Richard Posner on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. In a previous career, he was a newspaper man at the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, and for many years at the Forward. It is my distinct pleasure and greatest honor to welcome Professor Eugene Kontorovich. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, thank you all for thank you all for being here. Um, and uh, Lauren mentioned the situation in uh, Ukraine, uh, and I think I might use that as a jumping off point to discuss uh, some issues of uh, general interest and more along the uh, advertised topic. Uh, we're here to think about what does international law say about the borders of Israel. Right? What are Israel's borders in international law? What's in? What's out? What's the status of the West Bank? What's the status of Aza? But there's a but before I, we're going to delve into that topic. I promise you. But uh, there's a general problem people have when they talk about Israel and international law. If you ever talk about international law, law of occupation, you're probably only doing it unless you're really an expert on occupation law, and even then, only in the context of Israel, right? That is to say, anything you know about occupation, what is occupied territory, you have only heard, I'm quite sure, in the context of Israel. How, why am I so sure? I'll just give you an example. The United Nations has used the terms occupied territory something like, I'm, I'm approximating, but I did a study of this, 2,600 times in relation to all of the occupations in the world since 1945, since the creation of the United Nations. 2,600 times that language has been used. Uh, all but 16 of those references involve Israel. Uh, in terms of occupied territory. So, uh, the terms are, the issues are fundamentally entangled in our mind, and then how do you know what the law is? Because the problem with typical applications of international law to Israel is they start with the case they're trying to decide. You, you, you have the defendant in front of you, and then you try to figure out what the law is. Whereas normally what we want to do, what we want to do, you know, if a judge if a judge has a murder case in front of him, or some kind of complicated, let's say, financial crime case, and his clerk says, uh, judge, you know, how should we rule in this case? The judge isn't going to say, wait, wait, hold on, tell me the name of the defendant, then I'll, then I'll let you know. He says, well, let's look, how are, you know, give me examples of other cases, give me the names of other defendants who've had their cases finalized and rulings and precedents. So, whenever we talk about Israel and international law, we want to stop talking about Israel and international law. What do I mean? We want to find out, say, 
if, the, if there is such a rule of international law, in many, many situations, uh, I believe I spoke last year about the arguments of uh, whether Israel is obligated to vaccinate the Palestinians, issues like this. Say, show me, not with Israel, an example where, in a similar situation, the rules have been similarly applied. In other words, first figure out what the rule is, not let's figure out what Israel is doing and then try to look for some rules to hook it up to. So, as we know, there's a very commonly, uh, Ukraine, we're going to get into Ukraine, you're going to see, it's all going to fit. Uh, be, because to really know about Israel and international, the problems most people who are interested in Israel and international law are really only interested in the Israel part. But to know about international law, you need to know what's going on everywhere else in the world. That's the international part. Right? So if you're only talking about Israel, it's already not so, it's not international law. Um, so the claim is made that Israel is an occupying power in the West Bank and Gaza. And so we need to know what that means. An occupying power, occupation, is a, a situation that arises under international law, under treaties known as the uh, Geneva Conventions of 1949, the Hague Conventions of 1907, in which, during a war between two countries, one country takes over the territory. Let's say the country A takes over the territory of country B, not just during, during the battle, but takes it over and actually begins to administer the government there. Right? Begins to function as the local government. That's an occupation. When using military force, they displace the previous local government. It's not illegal. It's just a thing that happens in war. And then there are rules governing it. So you have a war between countries. One country displaces, takes over the territory of another country. Okay. So with those elements, you need a war between countries. You had that in 1949 and in 1967 because Israel and Jordan did have a war. So there is this aspect of a war between two countries. It has to take over the territory of, uh, of another country. Now here, it gets much more complicated. You can obviously uh, not occupy your own territory. Let me give you a hypothetical example. Let's think about this. Let's think about this. So Russia now controls Donbass and Luhansk, two uh, regions of Ukraine. And they're pretty well entrenched. Ukraine has not really been trying to kick them out because uh, it didn't have the force. Uh, it kind of settled into this situation where they didn't say, they didn't acknowledge that it belonged to Russia, but they were not capable of dislodging them in the short term, in the foreseeable future. So let's say that changes somehow. And, you know, God is gracious to the Ukrainians, and through some kind of miraculous conflict, they manage to expel the Russians from Luhansk and Donetsk and retake this territory. They would have to replace the government because there's a Russian administration there now. Would anyone say that Ukraine is occupying Luhansk and Donetsk? Of course not. They took back their own territory. It's not Russia's territory. So you have to, you, it, you, it needs to be the territory of the other country. So to understand whether you can say an occupation began when Israel took over territory in 1967, right? It did take over territory in 1967. But you have to ask, what's the status of that territory before 1967? In other words, you need to know whose territory is it? Because unless you can show that it is Jordan's, for example, or Egypt's, you have a problem, right? And if you can show that it's Israel's, then there's really not what to talk about at all with occupation. Uh, again, I'm just a, this is the basic law of occupation. Nothing fancy here. You need to, it, you, it, uh, I can cite to you the United States Defense, Defense Department uh, manual on the law of war, which actually goes further and says not only is retaking your own territory not occupation, but even friendly territory. Like let's say you're on the side of another country and you manage to liberate some of their territory. That's also not occupation. It has to be enemy territory, territory belonging to the enemy. So then the question is, what was the status of the West Bank when it came under Jordanian occupation in 1949? Right? And that's an issue that we can pursue. In other words, what were the borders of Israel when Israel was created in 1948? And here, we're not, you know, the temptation, I know, is to look at specific 
Israel-related factors. Everyone wants to say, oh, what about the UN General Assembly uh, partition plan? What about the armistice plan? What about all these things? So a lawyer knows what abouts are not useful unless you know what is legally relevant in advance, right? You have a, a rule of law which identifies which pieces of information are legally relevant and which are not legally relevant. So there is a international law rule that is used all around the world to determine the borders of new countries. If you have a new country created, this will determine the borders. Uh, and you, we're gonna, you, Ukraine is a good example. Ukraine is a good example in this case. Any country is an example, but this is a good example. The rule is very simple. There's many ways that we can imagine drawing the borders of countries based on historical things, demographic things, topographic things, but those are all complicated factors which clearly show one obvious answer and often cut against each other. So if you had to think hard about the borders of a new country every time it was created, you'd have a lot of conflict. In 1945, when the United Nations was created, it had 50-some members, I believe. Now there's 193. So there's a lot of new countries. If you need to have a whole investigation every time a new country is created, it would be a recipe for constant conflict over its borders. So there's a rule that's very simple. Right? Its power is its simplicity. It only takes one factor into consideration. If you have a new country created, whether through decolonization, cession, um, secession, or any such process, the borders of the new country will be the borders congruent with the borders of the last top-level administrative unit in that area. The last top-level administrative unit. That an administrative unit that was not a country, but was whatever the local government was. So for example, what's the top-level administrative unit in the United States? U.S. states. So let's say California were to secede, right? Maybe there would be people like in Northern California, Shasta County farmers that don't want to go along with everyone else. Tough luck, they'd be in it, okay? That's a top level administrative unit. Um, now, crucially, the, those units were drawn previous to the new country becoming independent, presumably by some colonial, imperial, whatever, some other kind of power without consultation of the people. Doesn't matter. You have to go by those borders, even though they are inevitably arbitrary, don't take into account ethnic interests necessarily, because there's no alternative other than calling everything else into question. Let me give you an example. Take Crimea, as Vladimir Putin did in 2014. Um, so we hear in relation to the Palestinians that there's this um, demand for self-determination. An ethnic group should be able to have its own country or be part of whatever country it likes. So the people in Crimea, most of them, they're not Ukrainian. They're not Ukrainian. Most of them are Russian. Most of them want to be part of Russia. It's been part of Russia for almost the entire history of Russia. Indeed, how did it even come to be thought to be Ukrainian in any sense? So the Soviet Union was composed of um, a dozen some, like 14, I think, Soviet Socialist Republics. 16. Um, Russia was the biggest. Ukraine was the second biggest. And Crimea was part of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic. In the 1950s, Nikita Khrushchev had, for complicated internal political reasons of his own, redrew the borders to put Crimea inside the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Did he ask anyone? Did he ask the Crimeans, the Ukrainians? The... He didn't ask anyone. The general secretary of the Central Committee of the Politburo. He just did it. And it, nobody even cared that much because everyone was still being ruled from the Kremlin anyway. Nonetheless, right from then on, it was part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Ukraine becomes independent in 1990. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, it automatically gets the borders of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic even when they were drawn in this, what we would call, arbitrary and inconsiderate way. So it's true, most of the people in Crimea want to be part of Russia, not 90% like they said in the referendum they had. That's just the only number that comes out of Russian ballot machines. But um, <laughs> right, for sure, for sure uh, a majority, let's say. We don't count that, we, we don't count what they want. International borders have to have stability. 
Otherwise, it's constant anarchy. Right? This is exactly what Putin was saying about eastern Ukraine. There's Russians living there. No, so you can't have, you know, every, to every place there's Russians living, it needs to be part of Russia. This is exactly the argument that's made to Israel. Oh, but there's Arabs living in these places. Every place Arabs live have to be part of an Arab country. This would be a recipe for the constant devolution of countries and anarchy. And it's exactly what the international community rejects in regards to Ukraine. So there's Russians. Let the Russians live under, uh, under, under Ukrainian rule. It's not impossible. So that's a very powerful concept. And this concept is applied to situations exactly like the situation of Israel. Of course, what was the top level administrative unit before the state of Israel? Anyone know? The mandate for Palestine, exactly. The mandate for Palestine issued by the League of Nations in the 1920s and administered by Britain. Now, it's important to know that there were several other mandatory territories. In, in the world. We only hear about the mandate for Palestine because who, who cares about anything that happened a hundred years ago uh, unless it involves Jews. But there was mandates. Uh, 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 Rwanda, Burundi was a mandate. Uh, British and French Togo land were mandates. Numerous mandates in Asia. Uh, and then of course Lebanon, Syria uh, and Iraq were all created from mandates. Nobody remembers those mandates anymore. But the point is this. All of those countries, were, their borders were drawn in a similar system to Israel. So, for example, Lebanon. There was no such thing as Lebanon before. There was an area around Beirut that had a Christian majority that was a separate entity. And uh, the French added on to it a large Muslim population to make the country sort of bigger and more um, robust. Those Sunni Muslims in the Bekaa Valley were not happy about that to be a minority in a Christian country. And they argued repeatedly for a partition, right, for a two-state solution, to split Lebanon into like a little Christian thing. And a, they didn't get that. And so when Lebanon was created, it had the borders it had and a Christian majority. It no longer has a Christian majority for demographic reasons. But that's a separate issue. Syria was composed of a country with many different ethnic groups in it, right? Sunni Muslims, uh, Shia, Druze, Kurds. And there were many, many proposals to redraw the borders in different ways. The French at some point um, were going to have a Druze state, a Kurdish state. In the end, they put it all together. And why do the Kurds not have a state? Not because they don't deserve it. Not because they're not nice people. But because the borders of the mandatory entities where they lived did not include a Kurdish state. There was discussion to have a partition plan and split Iraq to create an, a Kurdish area. The League of Nations seriously considered. It's called the Mosul question, to create a Kurdish entity out of northern Mesopotamia. But they didn't. And so now those are the borders of Iraq. And even, you know, and, um, you know nice does not make mean is or even ought in, uh, in international law. So the borders of the mandatory entities become the borders of the successor states. Yeah, and there's always an ethnic minority that's unhappy about it. There's no other way to do it, actually. And to, to undo the borders of the mandates would be to change every single border in the Middle East. So what do we have now? What we know that the borders of the mandate for Palestine, pa mandatory Palestine, and again, it was called Palestine not in any kind of ethnic sense. It was just a geographic indicator. It did not mean Palestinian in the sense that it has taken on of a uh, Arab population. Palestine meant people living in this uh, geographic area. You know, the Jerusalem Post used to be called the Palestine Post. It was a Jewish newspaper. Uh, the, um, the mandate for Palestine, its borders were very clear. Right? It extended from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River and included Aza. So there was no West Bank it was just that little sliver, the little sliver from the river to the sea. It had pre previously, the borders had included all of Jordan, the country now known as Jordan. The British split that off, so that becomes a separate top-level administrative unit. In 1948, the application of universal rules of international law would lead a very clear result. The result would be that the border, and th this applies automatically. A country, to have its borders determined this way, it doesn't need to submit a request. Right? Most countries, you know, there's no one to submit the request to. This is the rule that says these are the default borders. 
It's true, the United Nations suggested those borders be changed, but that suggestion, which was just a suggestion without legal force, was not adopted. So the way this rule works is, it's not, you know, it doesn't go by what your suggested borders are, but what the borders of the last top-level administrative unit was at the moment of independence. So this would mean that when Jordan invaded and took over the area of Judea and Samaria that they called the West Bank, and most of the city of Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem, the holy sites of Jerusalem, they were occupying territory to which Israel had a sovereign claim. Thus, when Israel kicked them out, to go back to our Donetsk example, or Luhansk example, Israel could not be said to be an occupying power, but was simply putting back under its authority territory to which it had a, a sovereign claim. Thus, no occupation of West Bank or Gaza, and thus no question about the legality of settlements and so forth. But if you were to, for some reason, disagree and think special rules apply to Israel, and maybe that Israel is a unique situation, which is how international lawyers often describe it. They say it's sui generis. That means unique rules, which is nice for them. Um, the uh, means you don't have to line things up with the other rules. The, and you, if for some reason you think that an occupation did begin in 1967, when would the occupation end? Again, an occupation is a situation that exists during a state of war. Need not be actual war, conflict, but during a state of actual or formal war, right? Either actual hostilities or a de declaration of war. Is, but it, it does not exist. There's no such thing as, it's part of the law of war. Right? So there is no occupation without war. Peace ends occupation. So when Israel and Jordan signed a peace treaty in 1994, even if there had been an occupation, the advent of peace would put an end to any application of any part of the Geneva Conventions. And this is just not me saying so. Jimmy Carter's legal advisor in the State Department Right? Probably not a big Zionist. Jimmy Carter, State Department legal advisor, wrote in a memo in 1978 that under his analysis, the West Bank was occupied, and I dispute that analysis. It was a very brief memo. He didn't actually go into the arguments I just described to you about the standard rules for determining borders. But he says, in any case, if Israel were to make peace with Jordan, occupation would be over, no question about settlements, etc. Why did he say that? Well, because... He didn't know that it would happen. Maybe he wouldn't have said it if he... But he was just, you know, now, now that it happens, everyone's like, oh, like we have to find some way that's not true. But in 1970, but the best way to know whether people thought it's true is like, what did they say before they found out what happened? So in 1978, when nobody would expect that Israel would make peace with Jordan, said, oh, well, that, of course, a peace treaty would end the occupation, but that's not happening, is it? Um, and the same with, uh, with Aza, the peace treaty with uh, um, Egypt would uh, end any state of occupation with Gaza. And even if that wasn't the case, so first of all, there was no occupation initially. If there was, it would be ended by the uh, Treaty with Jordan. And even if that was not the case, it would certainly be ended by the uh, Oslo Agreement with the Palestinian Authority, creating a separate local government such that Israel does not remember. Territory of an enemy country comes under your administration. Right? The areas where 90% of the Palestinians live are no longer under the administration of Israel, pursuant to the Oslo Authority, which would replace any situation of occupation. Um, Aza is, of course, a different case because Israel has now left Aza and thus uh, arguably uh, waived any kind of territorial, uh, territorial claims through the manner uh, through the manner in, uh, in which they uh, left. But this means that any kind of conflict with uh, uh, these entities would not be governed by the rules of international armed conflict, right? because it's not international. It's an internal, it's an internal, uh, it's an internal dispute. And you know, I want to say that the entire international community agrees with me, because pe that's often people say, oh, well, like, what do people say about the argument? Do they all agree with me? I, I think I can prove to you that the whole world agrees to me. Because what are we describing, right? What are we, what are we saying? What's the question, right? We're saying a country that has a certain claim to territory based on this international legal principle of uh, prior borders, right? But within those borders, there is a significant ethnic minority that maybe doesn't want to be part of the country, right? And there's a war at the moment of independence 
between the new independent country, the unhappy ethnic group, and a neighboring country on the side of the ethnic group, co-ethnic, co-belligerents. Uh, and the, uh, the other country, the attacking country, manages to capture territory uh, um, that, would have, that would have, under this international legal principle, belonged to the first country. But the first country never gets to exercise authority over it because they lose this part of their war of independence, and part of their territory comes under the occupation of this other country, which expels all of its citizens, right? all of the citizens of the first country, and creates a country of just this minority group, an area of just this minority group. 19 years later, through a huge turn of events, the first country manages to retake this territory, which it has never had control over, where now no, none of its ethnic group live, because they've all been expelled. It's only this other ethnic group. And their claim to it is only based on this international legal principle. Um, I can prove to you that the international, entire international community agrees with me that on these facts, Israel is not an occupying power. Are you surprised? Yes. The whole international community agrees with me? I can prove it. How do I prove it? Because these are the exact facts that I have described to you are the facts of the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict over in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, and the Nagorno-Karabakh taking the place of uh, the West Bank here and Azerbaijan taking the place of Armenia. And when Armenia managed to retake Nagorno-Karabakh, which was an Armenian enclave, like a historically Armenian place where most of the people were Armenians, and like based on like history and stuff, the Armenians had pretty good arguments to it. But it was part of the Azerbaijanian Soviet Socialist Republic, so international law is pretty clear. Armenia managed to snatch it during the War of Independence, and then Azerbaijan snatched it back two years later, even though there's no Azerbaijanis living there, and the Armenians are, to put it mildly, unpleased. Not a single country in the world has said that Armenia is, Azerbaijan is an occupying power or that when it resettles these places. So that's the proof, right? The proof can't be from Israel because you, know, you take the most unpopular defendant in the world, we know what everyone's going to say. The proof is, let's look at it. Now we have another case that's exactly lined up. That's exactly lined up. Um, so I can say that the whole world regards that uh, this is not occupied if you just like... Uh, put your hand over the name of the country in question. Um, if you had just that fact pattern. Um, so, uh, so that's quite compelling. Um, the, and we see it we see in Ukraine, similarly the notion that there's a Russian minority does not give neighboring states a reason to invade to protect that minority, or certainly does not give that uh, minority claims to uh, secession. Um, because there is almost no country. I mean, there are some countries, but there are very few European countries that are, there's really few countries that have one dominant ethnicity. Most countries have a major ethnicity and then a minority, which is usually less than happy about being a minority and maybe also allied with a neighboring country where that ethnic group is a majority. It's a very common situation. Uh, if, if it met, so you couldn't have a country, basically, if it meant that, like, uh, if a minority group had a right to independence. So when they're saying, and, and that's why the general rule is that's not the case, right? The Kurds don't have a right, no one has a right. So when they're saying that Israel has to do these um, unusual things or not be subject to normal rules because there's this Arab population, is to say Israel is not going to be governed by the general rules under which it's not going to be able to, allowed to be a normal country. That's, uh, that's exactly what they're saying. That's exactly what they're saying. Um, <clears throat> I've been asked as I, uh, as I came in uh, by a few people to comment uh, perhaps on the uh, situation in uh, Ukraine. Um, I don't, I'm from Kiev, but I don't really have much to say uh, about it. Uh, politically, it kind of speaks for, uh, kind of speaks for itself. Um, the, I want to speak about the... Um, lessons of this for Israel. It's much more, much more important. So, you know, Ukraine seems to be punching above its weight now. They seem to be doing okay, but what happens in the end, we don't know. 
Maybe they win, maybe they lose, maybe they lose less than they could have. You know, they're not getting Crimea back, they're not getting Lugansk back, they're not getting Donetsk back. So like, it's not likely that they're going to win-win. Um, but uh, we'll see. Um, Ukraine should not have been having like this battle in its cities with like artillery like, used against its buildings because they should have been able to prevent this war entirely because they had nuclear weapons. Right? This would not have happened if they had nuclear weapons today. Uh, they had nuclear weapons, and in 1995, as part of this post-Soviet euphoria, this notion that history was over, conflict is over, we're all going to respect international law. Um, this was, by the way, the, the year of Oslo II, right? the, the uh, fundamental the specification of the Oslo Agreement, the Oslo era. Uh, Ukraine was induced by the West to sign an agreement giving up its nuclear weapons. Now that's like a thing to, that's a not obvious thing when you have a historically hostile neighbor with nuclear weapons. But what the, they got an agreement out of it. It was called the Belgrade Declaration. And Russia promised they recognized Ukraine's existence as a state and its territorial borders. Right? Have we heard that before? They recognized, they're like, oh, the Ukrainians should be so happy. Russia signed a piece of paper recognizing. And even better, America and Britain and France signed also that they were going to ensure Ukraine's security. So it worked for 20 years, maybe, for 10, 10 years, 15 years. And then it stopped working. So when you make permanent, but they're not, they're not getting the nuclear weapons back. When you make permanent concession, you have, when you, you have to really think hard about a deal like that. If you're giving up a, something that's permanent, for something that's very, you know, that's inherently temporary. A promise of peace is inherently temporary. They gave up a strategic asset, right? right? Nuclear weapons. Israel is also constantly being asked to give up a strategic asset, namely strategic depth, right? If you look, Ukraine's a big country. They can slow the Russians down for a very long time. Long way to go to Kiev. Israel's not a big country. Strategic dip depth is a, its major strategic asset. Uh, to give up something strategic for uh, executory and vague promise that, uh, whose execution is going to depend on the political situation in the future. Right? Everyone says we're going to help you in the future, but when it comes to the future, everyone says, well, like we didn't mean that way, and the you know, situation is difficult, and who wants war? So um, don't make that mistake. Uh, another mistake that the West made is, uh, this is very not surprising what happened. Putin, for about a decade now, has been saying pretty weird things about Ukraine. He's been saying, Ukraine is not a real country. Ukraine's a made-up thing. There's no such country as Ukraine. It's just like a made-up thing. They don't have a right to exist. So the reaction was, that's Putin being Putin. That's the way these dictators talk. It doesn't mean anything. Because it was easier to say that. Because then you don't have to do anything about it. So, of course, we see this is the same thing now going on with Iran. When they say Israel does not have a right to exist, Israel shouldn't exist, we're going to wipe Israel off the map. So State Department people like to say, that, that's just like, you know, Persian speech. Like, that, they're very colorful that way. That's just how they speak. Mullah talk. It just, mean, it just means they don't like Israel. But if you don't take the rhetoric seriously, the, the next step is you're going, to have, you're going to have to take the war seriously. Uh, and it's going to be a defensive war in your own backyard. There's, there's no room in between the rhetoric and the next step, right? There's no room. It's first they say, and then they do. So if you want to stop them before the doing, you can't wait to the doing, and you need to take the saying seriously. That uh, if, you say, if, you, if, you, if you deny another country, uh, if a regional enemy denies a country's right to exist, that should be enough to trigger a right of preemptive self-defense on the part of the country who's, um, right, uh, whose uh, existence uh, is, is being denied. And it's very nice how everyone's rallying to the cause of Ukraine right now that they have Russian tanks in the, the city. But uh, the Ukrainians would really not rather it be this way, right? And we wouldn't rather it be this way with Israel, right? Everybody likes you when you're getting your butt kicked. But, you know, what you'd rather really be doing is not being in that situation in the first place. And that's what we need to really focus on. Okay, happy to take questions.